due to a long inter argument among the eight of us who consist of the leadership of the Bundes movement we have not been able to upload onto our channel. Sorry for the inconvenience and we reserve the right to our PO pool that means arguing because we had to make sure that our conclusions were correct. Now many have asked us so are you guys Marxist-Leninists now? That's a little weird. Aren't Bundists not Marxist-Leninists? You know, um... That's a, a funny question to ask. Um, the correct term would be pantherism. Um, yeah. So... That's probably going to confuse a lot of people. But understand that we're Bundists. Okay, we believe in national cultural autonomy. We reject the Hengelian nation-state. Which is also why... Uh, we would shy away from the term Marxist-Leninist. Um, also, we do admit some of Trotsky concepts into our theory. I guess you could say that the overall the, the overall foundation would be what Bundism was, and still is. The concept of national cultural autonomy, the rejection of the nation-state, and, um, auto-determination over self-determination. Of course, I mean, there's a lot of missing literature. Like, you, you, may, not, you may be surprised to know this. I can't find the writings of Otto Bauer anywhere. It's a very frustrating thing to deal with when you can't find the writings of Otto Bauer. I also have never been able to find Gamal Abul Nassar's, uh, you know, book. And, and that, that's very frustrating. So... One often has to reconstruct things, by the way. Not, not that Nassar has anything to do with Bundism. However, we respect Nassar and we receive him as a revolutionary. Probably the greatest uh, and only successful revolutionary of Egypt. So we're sorry for the inconvenience of the lack of videos. I would like to point out that if you want to connect... If you want a, to know what category Bundism would fall into, or more accurately, modern Bundism which is tied back to the old Bund, by the way, but it's upgraded for today. Modern Bundism would actually fall under the lines of pantherism, because the Black Panthers, by the way, yes, they were practicing national cultural autonomy. Mind-blowing, isn't it? Internationalism is not globalism. Globalism is a method of cooperative first-world imperialism, aimed at reinforcing the poverty of the Third World. To some extent or another, we Boon disagree with Maoist Third Worldism. America has been the strongest imperialist country for some time now. Yet recently, the globalists have found that they desire to divest from the supremacy of the Americanists. If Americanism can be brought down, then we need to grasp that it shall take collaboration of both the Third and the Fourth World proletariats. The proletariat is everywhere. He or she is the customer service worker, the construction worker, the homeless, the young woman forced to sell her body, the waitress, the good father cheated out of custody rights, the young women and girls sold in human trafficking. Arizona is big for this. And that is just America. The third world proletariat has it even worse. America is the dominant first world imperialist country. The reason why Americanists fear globalist takeover is because it has been known for some time now that America is losing its grip of control over the rest of the First World. The First World consists of America, Britain, Israel, France, Japan, South Korea, Canada, Germany, in fact most if not all of Europe. The Third World consists of the most exploited, such as the indigenous South Americans. The majority of those who live in India most, if not all, of Africa and greater populations of Asia. Now keep in mind that there is a fourth world. These are the indigenous natives of America on the northern part of the continent, such as the first Americans of Canada or the various tribes in the United States of America. The indigenous aborigines of Australia, the indigenous natives of New Zealand, and yes, the indigenous Palestinians. This would be the fourth world. 
Let us clarify that world Jewry is forbidden to have any sovereignty. We have been loyal citizens of whatever country we have lived in. We now turn to a film from the leaders of our generation, Nigeria Carta. This protest took place on November 15th, 2018. This video, however, was published on November 16th, 2018. The rabbi speaking in this film is Rabbi Israel David Weiss of Nigeria Carta International. With the help of the Almighty, I pray to the Almighty to bestow upon me his truth, his wisdom, that I may be worthy of conveying his message and so sanctify his name and inshallah bring peace, peace to the world. Assalamu alaikum. We, as you see, you see clearly, we are members of the Jewish faith. We have people here from my colleagues who are originally from Jerusalem, many generations from Al Quds, from Jerusalem. We have Jews who are, as I am, uh, children of survivors of the Holocaust from Europe. We have people who have been living in Al Quds and in many other areas amongst Muslim people for generations and generations, for hundreds and hundreds of years. We have lived in harmony and peace. The issue, the difference of a religion was never an issue, never an impediment of being able to live in harmony and peace. This is a clear fact, a fact that although the Zionists who create a new history would like to dispute, but it's a blatant lie, what they're saying what they're claiming is simply repugnant. They are here today, they send representatives to universities where young, fresh minds are here to grow and become future leaders. They send their representatives who are learned in one thing, to turn history on its head, to turn facts on its head. And that is all they are here for. We are here to dispute that with the help of the Almighty. The fact is, again, we have a distinct difference of religion between us and our brothers and sisters who are living in Palestine and other Muslim countries. But again, not only was that not an impediment to coexistence, but on the contrary, as I mentioned, my father, for instance, escaped from Hungary when the Nazis invaded Hungary. My grandparents were killed in Auschwitz. We will turn back to Europe, to history, to these hundreds of years when there was the Inquisition, when there were Crusades, and even by the Second World War. And my parents, their relatives, when there was these decrees, I was just in Italy, and go back hundreds of years, wherever you will go, in Spain, when there were these decrees that Jews have to convert to Christianity, who opened the doors for them? Who gave them a safe haven? It was the Muslim countries. That's right. It was the Ottoman Empire, it was all throughout in Iran. It was in Palestine, which was under the Ottoman, Ottoman Empire, and they all, the Jews were embraced with the distinct difference of religion that we have. 
It was not an impediment, it wasn't a problem. We took care of each other, we babysat each other's children, we lived in harmony, because this is not a conflict of religion. What this is, is an ideology that was born around a hundred odd years ago called Zionism. It is a new, a relatively new ideology that is the backbone, that is the root, that is the source, that is the Zionist state of Israel. The Zionist state of Israel is not a Jewish state. They may wave the Star of David that they've stolen from the Jewish people. The symbol of Jews for hundreds of years, of thousands of years. They may declare themselves to be Israel. Israel is the name of Jacob in the Torah. But the name Israel, Jacob said that the Jews will uphold the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt that's all, observe the Sabbath. Ask them, let's just put aside what they're doing with the Palestinian people. What about the Sabbath? Why are they desecrating the Sabbath? But they're, all they are are hypocrites. They are not representing Judaism in any shape or form. It is a political movement. It is a transformation from religion, Judaism, religion of thousands of years, of 3,000 years, and what my grandparents and their parents gave their lives for. Zionism is a transformation from this religion to a base nationalism, a selfish political movement that decided for their convenience to use Palestine as their homeland. They wanted to use other lands, Uganda and so forth, but they decided the most convenient and the most successful idea would be taking Palestine and claiming it in the name of God and in that manner, anybody who stands in their way will be declared anti-Semites. We are here to refute that. We are here to declare that Judaism, because it is Judaism, with the Star of David, means that we are forbidden to steal, and on the contrary, we have to show our gratitude for the people of Palestine, of Palestine and of the Muslim countries for embracing us and giving us a home for these hundreds and hundreds of years. We hurt, we cry, we suffer with the suffering of the people of Gaza, of Palestine. Our hearts are with you. And we will not be intimidated with the help of the Almighty. Not by these messengers who are here in the university from the, from the Israeli state and not from the other people who are supporters of the Zionist state of Israel. We will continue standing and embracing our brothers and sisters of Palestine and praying to God and crying to the world leaders, stop, this cannot go on. The people of Gaza are being murdered daily. They don't have proper water, they don't have proper medication, food, schooling. Everyone is affected. Psychologically, I don't know if there's one person who is not damaged, who grew up in Palestine or in the refugee camps that we don't even know their names that are throughout the world in Jordan, in Lebanon, in Syria, that they are suffering. We went to visit in, in Lebanon. We went to visit in Jordan. We went to visit the refugee camps. It's indescribable. And who's talking about them? They're not even in, being spoken about. They're suffering. And the world is silent. Of course, there's unfortunately so much other suffering that the world is busy with. But we cannot forget every day that goes by is another day of suffering. Anybody who visits Gaza, we went to Gaza to visit many times. Me, I personally went a few times. We brought some just... A symbolic, we brought ambulance, we went to visit, we brought medicine. But that's only symbolic to show that we cry and suffer with them. We went to visit the orphanages. We saw families that were almost entirely wiped out. Why were they wiped out? Peaceful people. Simply because they want to live in the land that was theirs. That they were living in hundreds of years and yet they're being vilified as terrorists. This cannot be going on if the world is silent. We must speak out, we must speak up. And we are here in a university. We 
are here in a university where people are being educated to be leaders, future leaders. Please do not be intimidated. Go to our sites, go to nkusa.org, go to the links. You will see what the world doesn't even speak about. That there are thousands and thousands of Jews right now standing in Jerusalem on the streets. They're standing there and protesting Jewish people, religious Jews, because they refuse to accept the occupation and they refuse to serve in the Israeli army. People don't know, but the Israeli army has a draft and they're trying to force the boys and girls of the Jewish people to serve in their army. And they're being or they're arrested, they're being harassed, they're tortured, they're being beaten. And what a scandal is that? These are Jewish people. How they, they can't, can't claim that they're terrorists. Why are they being brutally beaten? Because they refuse to stand in that army and carry out those criminal acts of the Zionist state. They refuse. Yeah. And they're being beaten. They are being beaten and the world is silent. Yet they have the audacity to come to universities and say, Oh, we represent Judaism. And the ones who don't accept us, oh, they some ha they're just some radical people or so forth. We invite anybody to just go to Williamsburg, Brooklyn, right across the bridge. And what do you find there? The largest concentration of religious Jews and there's not one single Israeli flag there. And what is the reason for that? Because we refuse to accept the occupation in any shape or form. We don't accept the Zionist state. We are pleading with you. Speak out, spread around the world what they, the word what they're doing to the Jewish people because they refuse to serve in their army. Let the world hear the duplicity, the falsehood of the Zionist state. How dare they force, try, attempt to force Jews to serve in their army. This is un impossible, it's unacceptable, yet they're doing it daily. We have pictures how they're brutally beating Jews because they're serving, because they refuse to serve in their army. Go to our site, you'll see thousands and thousands of pictures of this. We cry with the suffering of the Palestinian people. This is ungodly, it's unacceptable. Our rabbis demanded, the chief rabbi of Palestine in 1947, and this is in the United Nations documents, stated, and again, it's clearly in the United Nations documents, one year before the United Nations ratified the State of Israel. And this is what Rabbi Dushinsky said. We furthermore wish to express our definite opposition to a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. We have that document and it's being distributed amongst you on our, on our pamphlets. Hear that. We don't, the rabbis, the chief rabbi of Palestine said we refused to accept a Jewish state in any part of Palestine and they were ignored. We cannot be silent. Do not be intimidated. It is not anti-Semitic to speak up against the occupation. <laughs> On the contrary, Zionism is the root cause of all this bloodshed of the Palestinians right. and the Jews. They are the root cause of all of this. Remember that. They are the root cause around the world of exacerbating anti-Semitism and creating hate and a rift between us and our brothers and sisters throughout the world of the Muslim faith. They are the cause of all of this. And then they have the audacity to come here and speak about their standing up and saving the Jewish people. And if we would get into the story of the Holocaust, they were the impediment to saving the Jews by the Holocaust. And that's a fact and it's all in our documents. You can look at our site NKUSA. So with God's help, I will not hold up this many other speakers, but we will stand here with you with God's help. And let us all pray to the Almighty to bring an end entirely to this unacceptable occupation of Palestine in any shape or form. God should help with his power that it should happen speedily and peacefully without any more suffering. And we should continue till that day comes to speak
speak out and not be intimidated. And if anybody approaches you and say you're anti-Semitic, say, I'm sorry, I live in New York and I see right in Brooklyn the large Jewish communities that because they are Jews, they oppose the Zionist state of Israel. So God should help, sooner nowadays, a free Palestine, a free Palestine, sooner nowadays. Let me just say a little mantra. Judaism, yes. Zionism, no. The state of Israel must go. Judaism, yes. Zionism, no. The state of Israel must go. One, two, three, four. Zionism, no more. Five, six, seven, eight. Israel is not a Jewish state. Five, six, seven, eight. Israel is not a Jewish state. One, two, three, four. Zionism no more. One, two, three, four. Zionism no more. Five, six, seven, eight. End the killing, end the hate. Five, six, seven, eight. End the killing, end the hate. Free Palestine, free Palestine. Is the next question deals with politics. What do you think about is the deal proposed by the Greek Egypt to consolidate power under the PA and thereby eliminate Hamas? Questions asked or what? that uh, according to Islam they cannot compromise with Jews and the answer and the question is can Islam ever accept that's a question and you should respect whoever asked okay I'm just here to read for the road and uh, can Islam ever accept the Jewish state We oppose Zionism because we are Jews. We oppose Israel because we are Jews. As Rabbi Israel David Weiss has stated, we have been under the protection of Muslim lands for centuries. The Zionist colonial project has no connection to the Torah culture. The Zionist ideology is in direct hostile contradiction to the covenantal religiosity of Moshe Rabbeinu, that is, Moses, our teacher. Free, free Palestine, and remember, liberation of the Jewish nation can not be achieved through any nationalist ideology, nor aggressive attempts to form a sovereignty. Only by national cultural autonomy can we find liberation. One of the most disturbing factors concerning the apartheid Zionist fascist state that has the chutzpah to hijack the collective name of Israel is its support of neo-Nazism in the Ukraine simply because the Zionist state wishes to halt Russian interests in the Ukraine. We turn now to a clip from the Real News Network that was published on November 12th, 2018. It's the Real News Network and I'm Ben Norton. Canada's Prime Minister has joined Donald Trump and far-right Israeli politicians in conflating support for Palestinian rights and criticism of Israel with violent anti-Semitism. The Canadian Prime Minister also demonized the peaceful boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, BDS, claiming that it is supposedly fueling anti-Semitism. On November 7th, Canada's Liberal Prime Minister Justin Trudeau gave a historic speech in Parliament in which he issued an official apology to Jewish refugees whom Canada turned away at the beginning of the Holocaust. 
The ship St. Louis arrived at Canada's shores in 1939, carrying 900 Jewish refugees who were trying to escape the Nazi genocide. Canada rejected this ship. So too did other countries. Eventually, the ship had to return to Europe, where most of the passengers were subsequently murdered by the Nazis. Canadian Prime Minister Trudeau apologized for Canada closing its borders to the refugees in 1939, and also for not issuing an apology sooner. However, toward the end of his speech, Trudeau suddenly made a turn and started to speak against criticism of Israel. He specifically singled out the Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions Movement, BDS. This is a peaceful movement for Palestinian rights. Trudeau claimed that it is Israel whose right to exist is most widely and wrongly questioned, and he linked this to denial of the Nazi Holocaust. Trudeau also tried to link criticism of Israel with the kind of murderous anti-Semitism the world saw in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where in a horrific massacre on October 27th, a Nazi terrorist attacked the Tree of Life synagogue, killing 11 Jewish Americans and wounding several more. Here is a clip from Trudeau's speech in which he tries to conflate violent anti-Semitism with criticism of Israel. Anti-Semitism is still far too present. Jewish institutions and neighborhoods are still being vandalized with swastikas. Jewish students still feel unwelcomed and uncomfortable on some of our college and university campuses because of BDS-related intimidation. And out of our entire community of nations, it is Israel whose right to exist is most widely and wrongly questioned. Discrimination and violence against Jewish people in Canada and around the world continues at an alarming rate. Less than two weeks ago, not too far from here, a gunman opened fire on worshippers at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh, killing 11 people and wounding six others. So joining us to discuss how Canada's prime minister is joining Donald Trump and far-right Israeli politicians in falsely conflating criticism of Israel and support for Palestinian rights with this kind of murderous anti-Semitism. To discuss this, we're joined by Ali Abu Nima. Ali Abu Nima is an award-winning journalist and the co-founder of the news website, The Electronic Inifada. He is also the author of several books, including One Country, and his latest book is The Battle for Justice in Palestine. Thanks for joining us, Ali. Thank you, Ben. So there's a lot to address here on several different points. What is your response? Well, whenever it comes, I think it's right that uh, Canada should apologize and make amends for its racist and anti-Semitic history. And uh, surely one of the most shameful uh, aspects of Canadian history, which is often, by the way, whitewashed in uh, comparison to the U.S., Canada tries to market itself as somehow more enlightened than the United States. It's not true, of course. Uh, Williams Lyon Mackenzie King, who was the uh, Canadian prime minister at the time of the St. Louis, was a notorious racist and anti-Semite. And in the phrase of a senior uh, government official at the time, uh, in regard to Jewish refugees, the phrase used by the Canadian government is, uh, uh, is none is too many. In other words, they weren't prepared to tolerate a single Jewish refugee from uh, Nazi uh, Europe. So it's right that Canada should make amends and make restitution to the victims of its uh, official anti-Semitism and, of course, principally to uh, its indigenous people whom it continues to oppress. Um, what is deeply cynical, however, is using this apology to one group of wronged and oppressed people in order to justify and advance the oppression of another group of wronged and oppressed people, in other words, Palestinians. And in the wake of the horrific uh, Pittsburgh uh, massacre at the synagogue by uh, a, an American Christian white supremacist Nazi, we have seen uh, Israel and its supporters, like uh, 
uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, going all out to, uh, to absolve white supremacists and Nazis and their enablers, uh, such as Donald Trump and his administration, and to shift the blame to the anti-racist left, particularly supporters of Palestinian rights. It's an absolutely cynical and disgusting move. But we saw, uh, for example, the Israeli government and top ministers uh, decrying those, uh, including many in the Jewish community, who are pointing at the rhetoric of Donald Trump for encouraging and inciting uh, these kinds of this kind of white supremacist violence. And we saw some of the establishment pro-Israel Jewish groups in Washington doing exactly the same as Justin Trudeau did, which is uh, to uh, use the, the outrage and horror at the, uh, the, the Tree of Life synagogue massacre to justify further crackdowns on the Palestine Solidarity Movement, which had absolutely nothing to do with it. And I think it's also important to point out that the background of this, this is going on while Western governments, are, including Israel, particularly Israel, are encouraging and supporting the growth of Nazism uh, across uh, the, the Western world. So a good example of that is Israel arming the uh, Nazi Azov battalion in Ukraine, uh, Israeli Tavor rifles, uh, are in their hands, uh, licensed by Israel. Of course, the Azov Battalion is now part of the uh, official Ukrainian armed forces, but it is the most fearsome and organized Nazi armed group in the world right now. And what uh, we also uh, revealed at the Electronic Intifada a couple of months ago is that the Canadian government, the government of, uh, of Justin Trudeau, the supposedly progressive liberal a uh, diversity-loving government of Trudeau was actually in contact with the Azov Battalion and its military attaché in Ukraine was meeting with the, the, uh, the Azov Battalion and was photographed with members of this Nazi militia. So while uh, Trudeau is attacking the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement, the non-violent uh, movement for Palestinian justice, freedom and equality, his government, along with the government of Israel, the United States, and the European Union, is actually encouraging and fostering Nazism in Ukraine and other countries. Yeah, and an important point you mentioned, a local Jewish leaders in Pittsburgh actually told U.S. President Donald Trump that he is not welcome in their community until he denounces the kinds of white supremacists uh, who was one of the people who carried out the attack, the the Nazi who attacked the synagogue was himself an avowed white supremacist. He was active on alt-right forums on the internet. Um, and this is actually an important point in terms of looking at the rhetoric of Trudeau and Trump. After last year, when a Nazi uh, attacked, drove a car into a crowd of anti-racist protesters in Charlottesville, killing a young woman, Donald Trump claimed that there was blame on both sides thereby legitimizing white supremacists and the racist violence by implying how they're equivalent to anti-racist protesters. Well, after the Pittsburgh massacre, when this Nazi terrorist killed 11 Jewish Americans, the Israeli ambassador, Ron Dermer, reiterated Trump's statement and, and essentially repeated it, claiming that, that the responsibility is on both sides, drawing a false equivalence between anti-racists on the left, specifically singling out the British leftist Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party, and implying that there's a false equivalence between them and the kinds of Nazi terrorists who attack the Tree of Life synagogue. Well, ironically, Trudeau, as you mentioned, who portrays himself as this liberal progressive figure, would you say that Trudeau, by trying to conflate Holocaust revisionism and denial with criticism of Israel and with BDS and the Pittsburgh massacre, do you not think that he is also like Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador, and like Donald Trump, isn't he also using this kind of both sides rhetoric to try to equate, equate Palestinian human rights activists and, and basically claim that they're equivalent somehow to Nazis? It's, it's utterly despicable. I mean, the Palestinian solidarity movement and Palestinians have always been loud in their opposition to right-wing racism, to anti-Semitism, 
The BDS movement has been very clear in official statements and in, in statements by many activists and intellectuals and scholars and writers that this is an anti-racist movement, that it stands in solidarity with Jewish people against anti-Semites. But whereas Palestinians and their supporters often find ourselves standing with our uh, Jewish comrades against racism, we see time and again Israel and its supporters lining up with the racists and inciting against, uh, against uh, uh, left-wing Jewish activists. And, and we saw that as well, that uh, the right-wing Israeli media was attacking left-wing Jewish activists and claiming that they brought this attack on themselves by supporting uh, bringing refugees and immigrants into the United States. In other words, using pretty much the same anti-Semitic rhetoric as the, the, the killer, the synagogue killer, who had been blaming uh, Jewish um, uh, groups for, uh, you know, supporting refugee resettlement in the United States. Again, the big picture here is that Israel, as a, as a right-wing, ultra-nationalist, settler-colonial project, its interests lie in demonizing people who support equal rights. And that's why Israel finds allies today amongst the worst of the worst. Hungary's uh, pro-Nazi uh, Hitler apologist, Prime Minister Viktor Orban, uh, Poland's right-wing ultranationalist government that uh, has pushed through this law to... Uh, uh, you know, basically enforce Holocaust revisionism with uh, right-wing neo-fascists all over Eastern Europe and the United States and white supremacists in the U.S. It's no wonder that Nazis like Richard Spencer in the United States strongly identify with Israel. Uh, and, and Spencer even calls him, himself a white Zionist because they see Israel as an ultra-nationalist purification project as the model for what they want to do in the United States. And now, the service Israel is providing to racists, anti-Semites, and white supremacists across the Western world is, that, is, is kind of a laundry service, where if, if they are pro-Israel, if they say they support Israel, Israel will defend them against charges of anti-Semitism. And that's exactly the role we saw Ron Dermer, the Israeli ambassador, playing with Trump. When the Jewish community in the United States was rightly pointing at Trump's incitement and encouragement of white nationalism and anti-Semitism, the Israeli ambassador was touring the TV studios to say it's wrong to criticize and attack Trump. That's the role Israel plays. Israel today is one of the biggest defenders of anti-Semitism in the world. Well, we're going to have to end our conversation there. I was joined by Ali Abu Nima, who is the co-founder and editor of the Electronic Intifada, which is an award-winning news website dedicated to original investigative journalism on Israel-Palestine. Thanks so much for joining us, Ali. My pleasure. Thank you, Ben. Of course, anytime. I'd love to have you back sometime soon. For The Real News Network, I'm Ben Norton. History is repeating itself, just as the Nazi fascist bastards had been in cahoots with the Zionist house Jews in the past, the Zionists of our time are now in league with today's overtly neo-Nazis. We of the Jewish Bundes Diaspora movement say no to the Zionists, not in our name. To recap, there are the four worlds. So let's start with the Cold War. The four, world, the four worlds during the Cold War, okay? The first world was the imperialist countries. The second world was the developing countries. The third world was the exploited countries. And the fourth world was those indigenous colonized countries, such as the indigenous Native Americans in the United States of America, First Americans in Canada, I would say also Mexico under a Spanish bourgeoisie, uh, while they're branded Latino and Hispanic when they're not Latino and Hispanic, and no, mixed blood doesn't count, because that's like when a European American says, well, I'm part Native American. Were you raised in the tribal society? 
and how much dominance does it have in your blood. And by the way, from the tribal point of view, your blood is not as important as the cult cultural upbringing. And this gets back into their origins of ethnicity as opposed to race, because there's only the human race. Now, in the post-Cold War context, that is the context of globalization, the second world would refer to the countries that are in decline. So mind you, in the Cold War, the second world would refer to developing countries, but in the context of globalization, it would be the countries in decline. And again, as for those fourth world countries, this includes Mexico and Palestine. Mexicans are the Aztec people, not Hispanic or Latino. Palestinians are the ancient Israelites. Confusing the, new sh confusing the Jewish nation, which by the way is based on a cultural religion, with the Israelites, aka the Palestinians, which is based on a cultural ethnicity, this is completely treason, okay? We have a history, of course, with the Palestinians, which, by the way, the Palestinians are the same thing as the Israelites. We have a history with them because the ancient Israelites used to be Jewish. But they have mostly con converted to Islam and Christianity. There are still some Jewish Palestinians, by the way, and I'm not just talking about a reference to the Samaritans. There is Neteri Karta in Palestine, which are Palestinian. This has always been the case. So there are Jewish Palestinians. So you could be Israelite and Jewish, obviously, but you don't have to be Israelite to be Jew. Not all, not all Israelites are Jewish, and not all uh, Jewry is Israelite. So, yeah, it is absolute treason to confuse the ancient Israelites with the Jewish nation, as the ancient Israelites would be the Palestinians, and the Jewish nation has nothing to do with your ethnic background. It has to do with whether you've been brought into a cultural religion, which is what the whole Jewish nation is based on, is a cultural religion. Just recently, on this January of 2019, Dr. Weisfeld was involved with the ceremony commemorating the founder of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine. What you're seeing in this picture is Dr. Weisfeld involved in this ceremony. Here's a real question for you. Have you heard about the anti-BDS laws? Have you heard of the Israel Oath Laws? Sounds like we, the Jewish people, are being scapegoated, and if you disagree with that, you're kind of foolish, I'd say. So anyway, I'm going to take you to the end of our presentation here, and the way that I'm going to finish this off is I'm going to now bring you to Jason, the Maoist rebel. He is going to point out a contradiction in capitalism that you need to be made aware of. This came out on January 10th of 2019. Well, it's 2019, we're in a brand new year, and there's going to be a whole brand new set of priorities for the Trump administration, and sometimes of the Democrats as well. Here's a perfect example. The first bill of the year reportedly is a bill to protect Israel from boycotts. In 2019, the GOP-controlled Senate will vote on whether the U.S. government has the authority to cut ties with companies that choose to boycott Israel. Essentially, the boycott banning legislation has apparently taken precedent over the ongoing government shutdown, which means voting to allow the government to punish people for boycotting Israel is more important than actually getting the government running again. Senator Marco Rubio, as the lead sponsor, the Combating BDS Act is expected to receive bipartisan support. Coincidentally, punishing corporations and individuals who support the BDS movement 
is a top legislative priority for APAC, the powerful pro-Israel lobby. Now, I don't need to tell you the seriousness of what this implies. Essentially, it's a censorship of freedom of speech. If you don't like what a company does, you can choose not to participate in it. If they want to promote the genocide of Palestinians, you can vote with your dollars and choose not to participate. Isn't it interesting that this lack of freedom of choice, which is supposedly what capitalism is all about, you know, you vote with your dollars and all that kind of nonsense, that you're free to do with your money as you choose and buy who you want to and the market will inherently regulate itself, that this kind of mentality is coming from those who don't want you to be able to boycott Israel. Amazing how that, that, how that just, just happens, that those the biggest supporters of the supposed benefits of capitalism are undermining those supposed benefits of capitalism. Now, this is, of course, a violation of freedom of speech. I mean, we understand that choice within the market is essentially a fundamental concept when it comes to a freedom of choice within the market. It even is a form of freedom of speech. If you don't like it, you can go somewhere else kind of mentality, and that is how the market works. You're not allowed to make a statement by saying, I refuse to buy from this particular distributor or this business because they uh, participate in Israeli apartheid. That is being taken away. So this isn't just a threat to your you know, philosophical rights in, in a capitalist economy, but a, a, a violation of your fundamental right to freedom of speech. And that's what we're facing right now. This is the tremendous hypocrisy of those who generally support capitalism in general. You're supposed to be able to go wherever you want with your money. That's what makes capitalism so great. To quote Jan Uger, would I love to be rich? Hell yeah, I'd love to be rich. And then it becoming a tremendous part of the problem. Sorry, I, I couldn't help but take a jab at, at Jan Uger there. For a guy who complains constantly about what capitalism does, but then turns around and defends the very system that causes it. Because that's essentially what we're looking at right here. Those who continually tout capitalism as being free are doing the very thing to undermine it. And it's it's terribly ironic. And does show the amount of power that APAC does have within U.S. society. Because there's a great deal of businesses who want to be able to do business with Israel without being criticized for. And because Israel is such a beacon of U.S. interests and defends U.S. interests in the Middle East, they will go ahead and write legislation like this in order to defend it. And that's why we really have, that's why we're in this situation. And that's why we have to tolerate this attack on our freedom of speech. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.